Okay, so we're holding in Kohelet towards the end of chapter 7, Perek Zayn. We'll begin Perek Chet as well today. Usually during this time of the year between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, many times I have done, uh, we've covered a, a topic that deals with Yamim Noraim, with the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, and so forth. But since we're a little bit behind on our schedule with Kohelet, and we'll be gone, we'll be away again for several weeks because of Sukkot, I decided to continue Kohelet today. And this is the 25th uh, Shi'or on Kohelet, and we have uh, several more Perakim uh, to cover. This uh, Perak, as well as other Perakim, contain, of course, many, many ideas that are very valuable in life. It is too bad that Sefer Kohelet, as well as Sefer Mishle, are not learned extensively. Some people have never even looked at it. This is Chochmat Chaim, this is valuable knowledge that can really give us tremendous insight into people's behavior, into a Kadosh Baruch Hu's involvement in the world, how he manages his affairs. Even though we're limited, of course, to understanding Hashem's ways, nonetheless, we do have um, some direction here between the Kohelet, Mishle, the Gemara, the Zohar, the various uh, Sepharim that our tradition says were composed by Ruach HaKodesh through divine inspiration, it means that they had direct first-hand information on why certain things happen and how the world functions. And the more we know about these things, the more it could help us understand and help us uh, deal with the many challenges in life. We're holding the following pasuk that says, Re'eze matzati amra kohelet ahat le'achat l'mtzoch This is one of those pasukim that are very difficult to understand. For the most part, kohelet is not a difficult sefer. Uh, I mean, he uses Lashon HaKodesh, even though Lashon HaKodesh is not exactly the language we speak today. Many words are, are different. Uh, he is a little bit poetic. He's not always clear what he has in mind, in other words, what his kavana is, his intention is. So we many times have to revert to commentaries. And when you go to the commentaries, you, you will find more than one, which makes it even more difficult. But as the rabbis have told us, Shev'im panim la Torah, elu ve'elu divrei lokim ha'im, when you see more than one commentary, it can mean that they're both true. They all are saying pretty much, uh, what Shlomo Melech may have intended to say. Even though they may be totally different things, they can both fit into the Pasuk. There are many messages, therefore, in, in some Pesukim, in some of the words that he says. So this is one of those Pesukim that is very difficult to make sense of. The literal translation just means, you know, behold, I have uh, found, Kohelet says, one to one, to find a calculation. I have found one-to-one, one, that there is a cheshbon, there is a calculation, there is something about numbers. What is he talking about? Now, sometimes it is possible that he is referring to something that he has said in the past. And some commentaries explain that that is what his uh, intention here is, that there is something about a cheshbon. Cheshbon means math in modern Hebrew. It means calculation. Right? It means also that there is a higher reason. That's how the word cheshbon is used. A higher reason or higher explanation for something that happens. So here he's saying that he has discovered that one of the mechanisms in this world involves the putting together or adding many small details together to form a big picture. In other words, there are quite a few details in life, there are quite a few small details that each one on their own may not make too much sense when you see it, when you experience them, but when you add one and one together, what you see is a picture emerging from this puzzle that is comprised of small pieces. So he says, I have discovered, I have found, 
that ahat leahat, that things add up. Things add up in such a way that there is a cheshbon. Well, what does that tell you? That there is a design over here. When you add up the pieces of a puzzle and you see a picture, that means it was intentionally, intentionally designed as such. It, it, it's not possible that you just add up pieces and a picture comes out of it randomly. There's no such thing as a random picture that, is, that it contains detail. So part of the mechanism of the world, or one of the mechanisms by which the world operates is by details that the sum of the whole is a big cheshbon. A big cheshbon, in other words, it amounts to something. And the rabbis tell us that here he's referring to mitzvot and ma'asim tovim, of course, the good deeds, that these mitzvot that a, that a Jew performs, or that a non-Jew performs, I mean, if he's a good man, good deeds, they actually add up to something. They're actually stored in a cheshbon, in an account. Nothing is lost. As the physics, in physics they say that the energy is not lost, right? One thing is transformed into something else. Nothing is really lost. So all these mitzvot add up to a cheshbon. All the tears that people shed do not just disappear and go and were shed in vain. They add up and they're stored, as our tradition says, in a notzar, in a storage, where at some point later on in one's life, someone may need those tears, those merits, those deeds that have accumulated. So things accumulate, and as they accumulate, they become a big cheshbon, which means that they are stored and they are saved. And because the mechanism works like that, that things accumulate, this mechanism has the ability to bring about a, uh, a reaction, a positive reaction, that one detail or one masse, one deed, will yield another deed. As the rabbi tells us, in mitzvah, goreret mitzvah. When we perform one mitzvah, it gives us the ability, somehow it enables us to in the future uh, have the incentive, the desire, the interest to perform additional mitzvot. Which is great, because you get somebody to do one thing for you, you know, a favor. That little favor bonds the two of you. There's a connection here. And the ice is melted. In other words, if you did not have a Kesha before, there was no relationship before, one good deed, we're talking about good deeds, a favor, brings about a certain connection where in the future, the second deed may be easier. Husband does for his wife, wife does for her husband, a deed or many deeds. Judaism teaches that the act of giving produces love. Love is a connection. Love is not the passion of Hollywood. Love in the language of the Torah is a strong connection, a deep connection, a true connection, a connection of interest, of commitment, of interest, not selfish interest, but personal interest to do, to continue to bond together. And it's natural by children and parents. It's just there. It's a part of you. When it's not a part of you, when it's husband and wife, man and woman, it requires work. It requires something to be done. I mean, there may, there may be an initial attraction, but that's called the attraction. That's not the bond. It's just an attraction, which is good. There may be things in common, great. Even more attraction, even more bond. But in order to really keep it together, there has to be an interest. And that interest is more spiritual, of course. It's not physical. And in order to make it happen, the Torah guides us, of course, that you need to bond in a very, very unique way. How's that? You, each other, you become the focus, the center of all attention to each other. It used to be the parents. It used to be other people. Now, husband and wife, you are there for each other. So when, when a couple sees that, that they are there for each other and they are number one, more important than anybody else, even more important than the outside world, the parents and so forth, then there's a chance that they can build on that and really develop trust, understanding, and, and bond forever. 
So this is built into creation. There, there's a mechanism there that deeds, actions, form a chain that connects, that bonds, and that develops, and accumulates, and this is with mitzvot that allow us to do additional mitzvot in the future. You get him to do one mitzvah, maybe in the future it will be easier for him to do more mitzvot. After all, he sees it wasn't so difficult after all, right? He, you know, he did it. And that one mitzvah therefore leads to another mitzvah. Unfortunately, the opposite is also true. One avera, one sin, leads to another sin, or can lead to another sin more easily. He did it once, and the door is wide open now. He may do it again. If it was hard the first time, it's going to be easy the second time. And that's what the habits are all about. Habits, whether it's a habit in in a certain thing that we do, or habits with drugs where people are addicted. Addiction is a form of habit. The body has become habituated and independent uh, to something, and the cravings are there. And we're only human, we are physical, and it's very difficult to disconnect ourselves from those cravings. It requires tremendous willpower. It's possible, but it, it, it's a lot of work because you've gotten the body so used to something. Now, now try to undo that chain, that reaction, that energy that is flowing, that is keeping the momentum going. I want more, I want more, I want more. You know, how are you going to stop it? But there is, it's, it is possible to stop it. It requires a lot of work. So we see that things add up. And eventually, small change makes big change, they say in English, right? A little bit of tzedakah in the pushke, right? And eventually, it grows. Little by little, everything adds up. Another interpretation, an important interpretation that is found in the Midrash about this pasuk is that hat lehat Somebody committed a wrong during his life, you know? He may have cheated someone, he stole from someone. Uh, he did something not nice. Eventually, at some point, it catches up with him. There is a system in place. We know that. Those of us who believe, we know that Shem sees everything. And eventually, it catches up with him. He's unaware of it, because it could be 25 years later. And what happens is, somebody swindles him. <laughs> or let's not talk about money, let's talk about something else. Let's say somebody is making Israeli salad, you know? You know what Israeli salad is? They chop the vegetables very, very thin. All of a sudden, he cuts his finger. And blood starts coming out. You think that that just happens? No. It's a hat lehat lim tzocheshbon, the Midrash says. All these little things that happen that cause us pain, that let out blood, loss of money, it eventually reduces the cheshbon upstairs of what our debts have, uh, oh, well, what we owe. We have debts, sins, things that we have done wrong, all kinds of things, and they've accumulated. So all these little things that happen in our life, what they accomplish is they decrease the cheshbon. In other words, so when we come upstairs, our cheshbon, that is our account of things that are not so nice, has decreased as a result of all the little things that we've suffered that have made up for it. So now the books are balanced. So when things happen to us that are painful, all kinds of experiences that we're very, very not happy with, and we suffer, whether it's blood, loss of money, or all these kind of things that we didn't do it to ourselves necessarily, it just happens, we have no control. We should remember that there is a cheshbon, and everything adds up to a cheshbon, and everything therefore is done in such a way that it will affect the cheshbon, it will decrease the cheshbon, because we're getting it here, we're experiencing it here, and it's better to have it here than to have it upstairs. Very important idea. In other words, we shouldn't feel bad. Something is done, to, somebody insulted us, Shalom, embarrassed us in public. That's very painful to some people. Some people are indifferent. You know, they don't care. <laughs> and sometimes it's good to be like that, you know? You know, imagine somebody yelling at you. And there's an expression in Yiddish, you can yell from today till tomorrow. It won't help you. <laughs> in Yiddish, it sounds good. You can, 
Not everybody has the, the confidence, the self-confidence, to say that to a person. He's hurt. He may be hurt. He may, be, he may not understand what he's talking about. He may feel insulted. I mean, you know, people react differently to these kinds of uh, remarks. But the more confidence you have in yourself, and where are you going to get this confidence if not from Torah, and from the proper hashkafat, the proper outlook, that these things don't matter. And, if, and, and the only importance that they have is that, that they're actually good for us. If it's positive criticism, then we better listen. And if it's something which is very insulting and totally not right, then it's also Mishamayim. It doesn't mean he's right or she's right. It just means that if we are the victims, don't worry about it. Everything is accounted for. Everything leads to a cheshbon. And if it, even if it doesn't lead to a cheshbon, if there's another cheshbon already upstairs, this will take away from that cheshbon. Every one of these incidents that we're unhappy with, that are uncomfortable, eventually is for our good. Yonatan ben Uziel, as many times in the past, he has a different way of interpreting Pesukim. And I always look at what he says. Yonatan ben Uziel is the translation in Aramaic, but it's not just a literal translation as Unklos does in the Torah. Yonatan goes deeper into the concept, into the words. And he says that Shlomo Melech here is re referencing the Mazal. If you learn Kohelet, you will see that the Mazal is spoken about extensively. I mean, it just about in every paragraph, there's some mention about it, even though the word Mazal does not appear in his words necessarily. Indirectly, it's inferred that he refers to Mazal. Shlomo Melech, having been the, the most knowledgeable person that ever lived, according to our tradition, he knew about this wisdom too about this knowledge called Mazalot, astrology. And believe me, he knew a lot more than the best astrologers today. He had first-hand information. He, he received it from a good source. So he uses it to explain many of life's facets, many of, of the ups and downs in life that people have, marriage, business. Mazal is responsible for so much. But you have to be careful when you're dealing with this subject so that you do not forget for one moment that there's still something called free will. And we'll talk about it towards the end, that he makes a point of that. Because there were always different philosophies throughout the history of mankind that believe all kinds of things. There is no mazal, there is mazal, you have free will, you don't have free will. So he definitely uses it because it's a very important concept, idea, that explains many things in life. Why people have a different kind of life. This guy is totally ignorant, doesn't have a high school diploma, and he is a billionaire, not even a millionaire, a billionaire. And this guy who got a, a PhD, he's a genius, right? He's having a hard time making ends meet. As we say in Hebrew, he can't finish the month, you know? Why? How do you explain it? Because it has nothing to do with the head, with Chochmah. It has to do with something called Mazal. All right, so we've spoken a lot about this. It could be, as Yonatan ben Uziel says, I mean, that this is also one of the ideas that he's expressing here, that in order to understand a person, an individual's life, you have to cross the T's and dot the I's, as they say in English. You add up all the details of his life of his mazal, mazal that is, consists of many details, and you're able to get the picture. You're able to see a picture emerging, oh, I see. That is why he got married at 22, he had a lawsuit at 35, he, got, he had kidney stones on the, at, the, at this stage of his life, uh, he had a tremendous loss, he had a tremendous inheritance here. These are all details of a person's mazal. Some people have this kind of mazal, some people have that mazal, and it's all pretty much predestined when he's born. And if you know, if you really are very good at it, you're able to figure it out in advance of what kind of a person's life this will be. What will he have? You can tell how many kids he will have if you know how to read his hand, how many will be boys and how many will be girls. It's all written, right? How long he will live approximately, what physical ailments he will have, depending on how good you are. So that, 
That's another interpretation of this pasuk of the details on how a mazal consists of all kinds of details. And there's, of course, a reason for all these details, but when you see it, all the details put together, you understand why this person has this kind of a life. This one, this man, is so popular. Everybody likes him. He has a smile. Somehow there's something about him that people just like. This other guy, you know, he's so uh, just, you know, not likable. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what the word for it in English is. There's, in Spanish they say one person is simpatico and one person is antipatico. In other words, I think there's something similar in English. You know what I mean by, he has hen, sympathy. You know? Charisma. Charisma, even though charisma is another word. And some people, you know, sour face. <laughs> you know, whatever. What does that have to do with? It has to do with mazal. The mazal endows him. Now, it's also a gift from Shammai. Obviously, there's Berachar from Shammai, there's gifts from Shammai, but those gifts can come about through the mazal too. So that's what he's saying too, that there are details that emerge in giving you a picture of a person's mazal if you knew how to look at the, uh, at the details. All right. So the bottom line is, in the same way that we add 20 plus 20 to get 40, we add numbers to get a cheshbon. In the same way, it's true with the marechet hashamayim, with the system of shamayim, that in life, when you add up everything, everything adds up to a cheshbon that is accurate. In other words, this one has this, this one has that. No one has everything. This one has a good wife, but he has a difficult livelihood. This one has an easy livelihood, but he doesn't have such a good marriage. You know what I mean? See what I mean? So in the end, everything adds up to a accurate cheshbon pashamayim. That's the way the system works down here. Things are not just random. Things are not just, you know, by chance. Everything adds up to a cheshbon. Okay. Now we've come to a very... Uh, let's call it uh, enigmatic or difficult pasuk that is especially difficult for women more than for men. Okay, so listen carefully. Don't get the wrong ideas. Shlomo Melech says, Asher od bikshan afshi, I've looked into life a little bit more, and you know what else I find? Lo matzati adam echad me'elef. And I didn't find Adam. That's the way we should read it. In other words, I did not find exactly anybody who's perfect, but I did find one in a thousand an Adam, a man, that I can trust. Okay? So here it's a little bit difficult to understand where he's leading to, so I'm going to give you various interpretations. In other words, it's not easy. It's not easy to find people who you can trust. It's not easy to find perfection. But one in a thousand I did find, a man. But a woman, I didn't even find one in a thousand. <laughs> now, why is he saying a thousand? Because he had a thousand wives. Okay. <laughs> So he says, of all the thousand, they don't come close to his mother. Well, obviously he's comparing. He says, I didn't find it. I didn't, I, didn't, I thought I would find better and better and better. I, said, I took more and more. <laughs> he tried Iranian women, wasn't successful. <laughs> he went to Indian women, right? He tried everything. So what's going on? What is, he, what is he really telling us over here? The simple interpretation of the Pasuk, the simple interpretation is that we're talking about strength and weaknesses in handling the Yetzirara, handling temptations, handling challenges in life, difficult challenges. He says human beings are frail. You, if, you, if you tempt them, they fall. They can break. He says, therefore, I don't find too many people, you know, one in a thousand, that are so strong that they can resist all the pressures in the world. Imagine if somebody comes, just think about it, imagine if somebody comes to you and tells you, 
you know what, I need a favor of you. Uh, do this or that for me. And you wouldn't do it. Because it's not right, because you don't think it should be done, or whatever. But if he offers you $25,000, you're going to think about it. Right? They say about police in certain countries in Latin America that you can easily pay them off. It's true. He's going to stop you for a red light, for speeding, you pay him off with a few pesos. They say if you try it in this country, it won't work. I disagree. What do you mean I disagree? It won't work with $10, but it will work with $2,000. And if it won't work with $2,000, how about $5,000? When would you want to pay $5,000 to a policeman? Maybe for drunk driving? I don't think you'd think about it if you were, if you were drunk. <laughs> but but I, I just gave you an example that bribery is powerful. You can buy almost anyone. It's just the price is different. If you told Obama, listen, Mr. Obama, you know, can you really help me get this law passed? Obama says, no, it's too difficult, or I don't believe in it, or I don't think it's a good idea. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sponsor a, an evening for you, and I guarantee you that you will make $5 million in this evening that will go towards your attempt to be reelected. You know, no guarantee you'll be reelected. $5 million is a lot of money. He says, okay, tell me a little bit about what this law is. <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah? yeah. And if not, how about $50 million? Well, some people have that kind of money to give. And guess what happens in real life? They do it. They go to senators. They go to governors. They go to people who have a say or have power. And that's called in English of the 20, 21st century, lobbying. <laughs> that's what it's all about. So Shlomo Melech says, you know what, I've looked into human beings, can't find too many I can trust. Or he's talking about people that generally fall. And he says, I found a man sometimes, a man in a thousand, that can resist all the pressures no matter what. But woman, I didn't find yet. Why not? So the simple interpretation is that women tend to break more easily than men. That's what the rabbis tell us. Now when it comes to childbirth, however, when it comes to childbirth, Hashem gave women much more endurance to endure pain, physical pain, than, to, than men. Men cannot endure physical pain as much as women can. But emotional pain, emotional torture, temptations, Sedu seductions, the women will fall quicker than the men. Doesn't mean the man will fall. The woman will fall easy, much quicker than the man. That's just a fact. And I'm going to prove it to you in a minute <laughs> with a story. So that's a simple interpretation. The second interpretation is that, that this is based on Yonatan ben Uziel, is that Shalomo Melech is referencing what he has said in the past that there's no such thing as a tzaddik, a righteous man that never sinned, that never did it wrong. We all make mistakes. Right? So therefore, he's basically saying, I find it very hard to, to locate such an individual that is perfect. There is no social, there's no perfection. And he's comparing it, Yonatan ben Uziel, to Abraham Avinu and to Sarah. Abraham Avinu was Yahid Bedro, the only one in his generation that was perfect. He was able to withstand all the challenges all the tests, he passed them. And so was Sarah. So here he's saying that neither is anybody like Abraham and neither is any woman like Sarah. So here he made, according to this interpretation of Yonatan ben Uziel, both the men and the women are equal because he's referring to Sarah and Abraham. That nobody's like Abraham, nobody's like his Sarah. So not even one in a thousand women can come close to the Shlemut. The, the, the righteousness that Sarah had. Okay, that's another interpretation because it's difficult to find somebody who's mushlam, complete. There's a tale, I don't know how true it is, but there's a tale, you know, the tale, a story about Shlomo Melech that somehow he got into a conversation with this woman he found as when he was wandering, the years that he was wandering, and he told this woman, this pasuk, man, 
One in a thousand I found, but a woman, not even one in a thousand did I find a woman who I can trust. And she was upset at him. How could you say something like this to the woman? It's not nice that not even one in a thousand women you found who's, you can trust, who's complete. So Shalom tells her, I meant this for your benefit. I meant this for the benefit of women when I made this comment. She says, for the benefit of women? Yeah. Had I said that, like by a man, one in a thousand women is righteous and trustworthy and complete, single men would be looking for that one woman in the world. Say, no, this is, yeah, there's something better out there. This, yeah, not so perfect. There's something more perfect than her. So I'm telling all the men in the world, there is no perfect woman. So that they should just get married. You won't find that one perfect woman, because there is no perfect. So, he, he's talking to, the, you know, was he's talking to the benefit of the women. To, so, so people sh who are single should eventually settle down and not be so picky. And he's also talking to the married men and women. There is no perfection. Don't get upset. Don't be disappointed. Don't be so demanding and don't expect better. I mean, obviously people have to work on problems. There are problems that need to be worked on. But there's so much that you can expect. People are not perfect. Everybody has a weakness or two. And men or women, it's the same. So this is a, a, as a benefit to women. Men should not continue to look for that perfect. There is no perfect. However, there is a agada or a story, a sipur, that is a part of our tradition. That, bef that the reason that Shalomo Melech came to this conclusion that men, one in a thousand, he has found that he can trust, and women not, is because of the following incident, which he used to prove this point to the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin says, "How could you say something?" Says, "Trust me." I tried it, I've seen it, and I'm going to show it, I'm going to prove it to you. They looked in his kingdom for the best couple. They found a couple who were very devoted to each other. Well-to-do, happy, with kids, established, fine people, good people. Shlomo Melech calls the man one day, he says, listen, I want to offer you one of the highest positions in my kingdom. You will have, of course, so many people under you. You will have tremendous power. And I will give you my daughter to marry as a wife. He says, yes, yeah. But I have one condition. I need you to chop your wife's head off and bring it to me. You want to marry my daughter, right? So you have to chop her head off. And then, of course, you get this. That's my only condition. So he says, Your Honor, anything you say, in order for me to get this position, in order for me to get what, you, you know, what you're offering me, I'll do every, anything for you, of course. So he gives him a sword to carry out this, the job. Puts it in the basket, he hides it, comes home. His wife sees that he's a little bit disturbed. Honey, why are you disturbed? Don't ask me, he says. I had a bad day. Uh, Okay, she can't get more information from him. She goes to sleep, and he waits for her to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. Takes out the sword, approaches her, and then he says to himself, how could I do this? She's my beloved wife. She's been devoted for so many years. It's too difficult for me to do. He goes back to his bed. Then he goes back again. He says, but I'm going to get all the riches, and I'm going to be in such a high position. And then he sees a little kid sleeping next to his wife says, how could I do this and leave those kids as orphans? I can't do this. It's impossible. I will never do this. And he lets go. Goes to sleep. The king asks for, for, for him to come. And he comes to him the next day and he tells the king, I'm sorry. I cannot do as you told me to do. And the Shalom Omelech says, you're a good man. Don't worry about it, everything is okay. You're a perfectly good man. I knew you would, uh, you would resist the offer. I knew your love is so strong for your wife that I predicted that you would not be able to do it. Okay, 30 days go by. 
this time the king calls the wife of this gentleman. You know, I want to marry you, but you're married. You know what it is? You'll be my queen. You'll be my wife. You'll be the second in command. Yes, but you're married. What, what, what should I do? Here's a sword and chop off your husband's head. <laughs> Bring me his head. Yes, Your Honor, I'll do it. He gives her a sword from plastic. You know, was it, the Midrash says, or the, the, where it's recorded, the story is, it says that he gave her a, a sword that the blade was made of bedil, of tin, a soft, very soft metal that can't kill. <laughs> but, you know, she doesn't know. He basically tells her to do what the same thing that he told her husband to do. And the woman waits for the husband to fall asleep, and she goes and approaches his bed, takes out the sword, and starts banging on his neck. And of course it doesn't do anything because it's a soft, it's a soft metal. And he wakes up and says, what's going on over here? And he says, I'm going to make you swear to me right now who told you to do this. And she, of course, breaks down. And she says, Shlomo Melech asked her to do it. So they both go next day to Shlomo Melech. And uh, Shlomo Melech is waiting. He knew this, that they would be coming to him. The Sanhedrin is there. And he's already smiling. And he says, you see? Why do you think I gave her a fake sword? Because I knew she would be prepared to do it. The man, he gave a real sword, and he knew he wouldn't do it. So you see, just to prove my point to you, the Sanhedrin, that the woman sometimes is capable of showing a lack of compassion, right? And not think clearly, and be tempted to do something that is totally not right, and break. You know, even though she was devoted and she had a good life and a good marriage, just to prove the point that even the best of the best can fall. So because people can fall, people can be tempted, be careful. Be careful with all temptations, be careful with the Yetzirah, be careful with challenges. Uh, don't put yourself in a situation where you say, oh, it's, nothing, it's okay, nothing's going to happen to me. No, people can fall very easily. Okay, let's go on. The next pasuk, he says like this, Levad re'eze matzati, what I did find, did discover, is asher asa Elohim et adam yashar vehem abikshu cheshbonot rabim. When Hashem created man, He created him with perfection. Everything is well balanced. Everything is symmetrical, the eyes, the ears. I mean, everything is just right physically. And, I mean, we're talking about a healthy person, obviously. And, even his kohot, even his abilities are pretty well balanced, meaning that there's no reason in the world why he should not be able to be yashar. I created him, Hashem says, yashar. Straight, honest, right. It was just right. Well, we have our inclinations, we have, of course, our weaknesses and temptations, but he's made in such a fashion, in such a way, that if he wants to, if he chooses to, he will not... He, he doesn't have to drift from the right path. Because Hashem made him so, in such a way that he can remain devoted, righteous, and good throughout the rest of his life. He doesn't have to cheat. He doesn't have to lie. He doesn't have to be bad. He doesn't have to be corrupt. He doesn't have to be. Because Hashem made him right. So who's the one that corrupts him? Who's the one that makes him that she kalkel, that he will deteriorate, that he will just go bad? He himself. Why? Because Hema Bikshuchesh Bonot Rabim, it's human beings who are, because they contrive, because they conspire, because they have all these plans, and because they have all these ideas in their mind, that's what misleads them off the right derech. People are not focused properly on what they should be. We have a mission. We have a trip. Imagine somebody has to get from here to Yosemite, right? Five hour, six hour drive or whatever. And he gets distracted and he goes off to Fresno or he goes off to some other city. I mean, don't get off. Stay on that freeway that you're told and you'll get to the park. And you'll enjoy it. You'll be there. You'll have fun. You'll have a good time. No, but people get distracted. They forget about their trip. They forget about their main mission in life. What are we here for? Right? There are many things that distract us. So if you fall for the distractions, you end up not accomplishing 
what we're supposed to accomplish. So, man has the potential to do everything right. And even the Yetzer Ara, the rabbis tell us, the Yetzer, the evil inclination that was given to him is for his good too. As the rabbis tell us, if man would not have the evil inclination, he would not get married, he would not have kids, he would not build homes. But what happened with the evil inclination? He sees that his neighbor is building a home, his neighbor is remodeling the kitchen, he wants it too. He wants to have a nice home too, he wants to have a comfortable home, he wants to have a newer home, he wants to have a better car. Right? He also wants to have a family. So, you see, he, so even though it's coming from the Yetzirah, it's a positive Yetzirah that Hashem implanted in us that we should be able to have normal lives. If a person would not have that Yetzirara, he would not even have the basics, he would not even want to do the basic things in life that are important. You know, Yetzirah is what, what makes us eat. If a person is sick, he doesn't, he doesn't have an appetite. But he needs to eat, right? Even if he's sick, he needs to, I mean, maybe eat less, maybe eat certain foods. But he has to, but he doesn't have an appetite. That's the time to eat. But he's lost it. So Hashem gives us a Yetzirara, of course, to balance things out, to make us have free will. Those are additional reasons of why we have a Yetzirara. But the Yetzirara is not so bad after all. It's, we, we need it to accomplish our mission. So what happens, however, is that in the end, we misuse the Yetzirara because of our Cheshbonot. Everybody with their own Cheshbonot, you know, Cheshbonot meaning with their own agenda. I think that's a good word. There we have people have agendas. Oh, you know, want to have a 20,000 square foot home, but therefore in order to accomplish that, I got to make up for the, you know, the salary is not enough. So you can, you know, how are you going to make up the salary? In an illegal way. You know how many people, unfortunately, are sitting in jail who are caught, uh, prosecuted for, committed, for doing illegal things? Why did you do it? The judge recently told a very wealthy member of this community, very, very wealthy man, very successful man, who did something very, very silly, illegal, wrong. You of all people had to do this, you don't need it. <laughs> you have all the money anyway. You had to do this, you know. It's like telling somebody, you know, imagine he has $500 million and uh, somehow he goes to the gas station and when the guy's not looking, puts some gas into his car. He didn't want to pay the, the $50 to fill up his tank. You, of all people, don't have to do that. You have the money for it. That's, you know, that's exactly the point. You have it. Why do it? Cheshbonot. All kinds of, yeah, I'm going to get away with it. Okay, it's, he's rich anyway. People have all kinds of theories of why they have to do certain things. Or I'm going to get away with it, or, or it's coming to me, or I worked hard enough, and it's not fair. All kinds of things that they, that uh, is in their mind. Which, of course, is the reason why everything falls apart in their life. In other words, it, all of a sudden things are not right, things are not working right. Because of these cheshbonot, the wrong cheshbonot, of doing things contrary to what Hashem wants us to do. This pasuk is also in, significant for another reason. Adam Yashar. Man is, the way he's created, is straight. And it's very possible that, however, that if somebody is tempted to do something wrong, uh, that he will blame it on his yetzer. Yes, yetzer made me do it. My yetzer made me angry, maybe this. Don't blame it on the yetzer, blame it on yourself. Because even though we do have a yetzer, and we do have certain weaknesses and temptations. Man, by virtue of the fact that he was created yashar, well balanced, means that he has the potential to nevertheless stay honest and stay straight and not succumb to the etc. He has that ability. There are many people that justify what they do because they have the etc. No, that's not a justification. There are many people that have a certain weakness, and I don't want to mention what that is. I think all of you understand that uh, it's very prevalent in West Hollywood, okay? And they say, oh, we have it from birth. Can't change it. What do you mean can't change it? 
man is created in such a way that even though the weaknesses are there, either from birth or later adapt, it makes no difference. But you have the ability to overcome it. You have the ability to control. You don't, they, they don't want to control it. Because it's just easy to, to allow the animal in one to lead you. Okay. Do as the heart desires. Do as the body craves and desires. Who says that that's healthy? Who says that that's good? Without Torah, how are you going to disprove them? Especially when you can show throughout history there were all people like that all over the world. And even though Ahmadinejad says there are no such people in Iran, I'm told that there are quite a few of those people. <laughs> yeah? It exists everywhere. The Torah speaks about it. Which means that, of course, it's wrong, and guess what? You can control it. Some people may need the outside help. Okay, outside help is okay. It's welcome. It's something good. We can't fix all the problems on our own. But it's something that is possible. It's something that's controllable. It's something that we can overcome. It's not just, okay, that's it. That's the way it is. Blame it on, on whatever excuse. There are no excuses. Man has the yashrut in him by birth. He has the, the balance. Just that sometimes, he, because of cheshbonot, ideas, trends, or because of abuse. You know, he was abused as a child. It could happen that he, he turns out like that. But he can come back to it. He has with him, within him, Hashem has given him the koach, the potential to overcome that. Otherwise, how we, everybody's going to go to court and judge, the Yetzer made me do it. <laughs> you can't get away with it. You cannot justify it like that. And this leads us to another point. Hashem, in creation itself, not only in the human beings, but in creation itself, Hashem put tremendous kohot, all kinds of energies, including solar energy wind energy, all kinds of energies, all kinds of powers that if man only knew and wanted, he could use them only for beneficial things. But he has chosen to make nuclear bombs. He has chosen to take energy and misuse it in the wrong way. He has taken metal and made ammunition from it, weapons from it, missiles from it. He doesn't have to. As the Navi says, when Mashiach comes, all that weaponry, all that ammunition, all that metal, will be transformed, will be converted into good things that are useful for, for mankind. Because there will only be good. There will be no interest in doing bad and harming people. But it's man's choice of what he takes from the earth that Hashem gave him to use for the good, and he uses it, unfortunately, many times for the bad. Even though People claim it's hard to change, it's hard to control, it's hard to deal with, uh, with one's desires and temptations. Man has proven over and over again that he can do it when he wants to. Uh, there are things that are bitter. Bitter, just by nature they're bitter. Man has proven that he can sweeten them. There's something called saccharin, <laughs> artificial sweeteners, right? even though it has no sugar. He has come up with something to sweeten it. So man has proven in more than one way that if he wants to, he can overcome all kinds of problems. We fly in the air today. Tell that to somebody who lived 150, 200 years ago. You know what? We will be able to overcome our inability to fly. Not by putting wings on us like the Greeks tried, <laughs> right? But by actually making a machine that flies. They, they proved it. No, that's not enough. We're going to prove that we can put man on the moon. Ah, come on. They've proven that. Man has proven that he can do all kinds of things that appear to be impossible. He can't control himself. He can make some changes that are not necessarily complete changes because your nature will remain what it always was, but at least control it. No. Of course it's possible. Man, man is capable of it. He has proven it many, many ways. All right. We have, I think, about, uh, yeah, about two or three more pesukim in Perekhet. We're going into Perekhet now. Another one of those pesukim that appears to have more than one message, more than one idea. 
the literal meaning is as follows. Shlomo Melech is talking once again about the advantage of chokhmah, of learning, versus not learning, versus being an ignorant. So one interpretation of this pasuk is as follows. Mi ke who can, who can be like a chacham? In other words, a chacham is fortunate, a chacham is lucky. A man who's learned, who has all this wisdom, and this knowledge, he has a big advantage. He understands things better than others. Mike hacham umiyo de pesha davar. Who can be like one who is able to understand, who's able to interpret situations? Oh, what does this mean? You know, rabbis, for example, tell us if there's an earthquake, what are the possibilities? What does it mean? The scientist who is in denial, who's an atheist, who says, oh, there's a San Andreas fault here running underneath. <laughs> the chachamim, the rabbis, knew if there's a big earthquake, and it's a very, uh, it has terrible consequences, of course, and a lot of damage and people die, that it means something. There's a pesher. There's an interpretation to this. It's not a random act. It's not just a fault in the ground. It means something. So who can be like a chacham, who can understand things? Obviously, that is a big ma'ala, if one is able to. Chochmat adam ta'ir panav ve'oz panav yishuneh. The wisdom of man will lighten his face. Rabbis tell us that the chokhmah, the wisdom that a person gains, it actually changes him. And that change in his nature is also seen on the outside. We get a glimpse of it when you see the face radiating, when you see something shining about him. Just like when Moshe came down one time from the mountain, he was shining because of all that glory, all that Shekhinah in him, which is, of course, even a higher level than just Chokhmah, wisdom. Nonetheless, there's a certain aura that envelops a man because of his Neshama, because of his closest to Hashem, that is seen much more on the face, apparently, than the rest of the body. All right. He mentions this in this Pasuk. And he says, as a result of that, Oz Panav that which was rough, also becomes softened. What does that mean? That even if there's a roughness to the skin, the shine is there, even if there's a roughness to the character, the chokhmah, the Torah, will soften him. It will give him humbleness. So one of the midot that are acquired through Torah is that even if you start off with a human being who is rude, who is crude, who is rough, right? The Torah will... will, will will change him. The Torah will, will make him softer. Why is he telling this to us? Well, obviously, this is the secret. This is the trick. We, we may have certain weaknesses. How to best deal with those weaknesses is through learning Torah. The Torah can handle the Yetzir. The Torah gives us the Oz. Oz can also be the strength that one has uh, as a result of the, the Yetzir that is trying to to defeat him, the Chokhmah, the Torah, will be able to deal with him, to deal with that strong Yetzer in softening him up. So the Torah gives us the Koach to, to spare, spare ourselves, to save ourselves from the Yetzer Ara. There is a story told about Aristoteles. Aristoteles once heard that there was a a Chacham from Rome that was coming to visit him, a very knowledgeable person. And this knowledgeable person was very proficient in Chochmat Yad. He knew how to read the hands. Reading the hands is a very complex knowledge, but it's a very, very accurate knowledge, much more than the stars, than astrology. You can actually see a lot about a person's life and character in his hand. So Aristo wanted to, Aristotelus wanted to test him. Let's see how much he knows. I don't want him to see me, because then he may know me. He may make up stories and say things because he knows me. So he sent, instead of, you know, how we have fingerprints today, he sent a cast. You can make a cast of your hand, like fingerprints, where all the lines are in the cast. Don't tell him who it is. Don't tell him who this belongs to. Just show him the cast with the lines. Let's see what he says about this individual 
who has these lines. Huh? Good test, right? So the, the Chacham looks at the cast of the hand and he says, this hand belongs to a murderer. It belongs to a person who is very cruel. It belongs to someone who has these very, very rough characteristics. And he starts listing a whole bunch of real tough characteristics. So the students who brought this cast say, ah, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He obviously doesn't know because he guessed wrong. Or he doesn't understand, or does not read like he claims he does. They went back to Aristotle and said, Aristotle said, just don't waste your time with him. He said this about you. And Aristotle tells his students he's right. He's 100% right about everything that he said. I have all those negative characteristics. I have this and this weakness. His, exact, his prognosis or his analysis of this hand is perfect. The only thing is through the chokhmah, the wisdom that I've learned, I know how to cope. I know how to control myself. I know how to deal with them. I don't succumb to those weaknesses. I'm able to be strong and not be tempted only through the chokhmah. And imagine Aristotle is saying this through the chokhmah of philosophy that he basically on his own was able to control himself. Through Torah, you would even be on a higher level. It contributes so much more to one's personality. It actually transforms the person into someone else. All right. Another interpretation is, has to do with the following pasuk. As you will see, these pesukim are somewhat related. Here he says, literally, I will abide or do as the king tells me, and I will follow my oath with God. The oath that we have with God, meaning our commitment to Hashem in Har Sinai to keep the mitzvot. What does this have to do with anything? Obviously, it's possible for a person to try to figure out why Hashem wants us to perform a certain mitzvah. And the, what we've seen before is that Shlomo Melech warns us that we can never understand the ways of Hashem completely. Even if you're smart, you're not as smart as Hashem. In other words, going back to the first pasuk, Mike hacham, pesher. Nobody can come close in understanding the chokhmah or pressure, they interpret the tzivuy of Hashem. And this is very important to keep in mind because Shlomo HaMelech himself made the mistake of saying, ah, this mitzvah doesn't apply to me. This mitzvah won't affect me. And he fell. He made a mistake in believing that he understood the logic behind the mitzvah. No. Just do what you're told, he says. Ani pi melech shemor, verdibrat shuat lokim. I will do as I'm told, even though I don't understand fully what the Pesha Davar is, what the interpretation of the Mitzvah is, that's none of your business. You will never be able to fully comprehend what Hashem's Kavanah was. Your mind cannot come close to His mind. So therefore, just do as He tells you. And don't try to, be, to outsmart the system. Like some people have tried. He Himself. Oh, it's okay. One time exception. No. No, you don't understand. So don't play around with it. Now, this is also an important concept for another reason. Shlomo Melech does tell us we need to follow what kings tell us. We need to be law-abiding citizens. Anipi Melech Shemor. However, even though we're told to be law-abiding citizens, as long as that law by a mortal human being does not contradict or go against the Shavuot that we have to our king, there are times that we have to give our lives and not accept what the non-Jewish king will tell us to do. That's what happened in Spain. That's what happened in Mashhad too, in Iran. That Jews were being forced to convert. It says, this we will not do. Some of them, of course, hid, concealed their, Jew their Jewishness to try to get away with it and hope that the times will pass. That's not always a good idea either. Because you get used to, to a diluted form of Judaism in the meantime. It's concealed, it's not authentic, it's not strong. 
right? The kids see that you're not as devoted, that you're hiding it. It loses its effect. At times we have to be strong. Yes, we have to do as the king says, but we sometimes have to say, no, thank you. We have a king, Bashamai, who has told us otherwise, and we will not contradict what he says. People who came to this country in the early part of the 20th century, they couldn't find a job so easily. And when they did find a job, some of them had to work on Shabbat. They made a mistake. Because that king told us not to work on Shabbat. But what about livelihood? He will provide for you. You will find a way to support your family without working on Shabbat. You didn't try hard enough. And some, of course, let go of the Shabbat. Once yeah, they let go of Shabbat, guess what happened to their children and grandchildren? They assimilated, they intermarried, married non-Jews. They're not observant. Their families are almost gone from Judaism, disappeared. One mitzvah, Shabbat. How could you go against the king? There is no excuse for that. There are certain things that you, you just don't do. You're hungry and you're dying in the desert, you can eat non-kosher food. That's the halakha. It's not idol worshiping that you have to give your life for. There are certain things that if you have to, you have no choice. A woman is giving birth, you drive her on Shabbat to the hospital. Somebody's drowning, of course, you save his life. Even if it's Shabbat, somebody is, is, is very sick, he's allowed to eat in Yom Kippur. Right? The Torah doesn't want us to die. But there are a few exceptions that the Torah says you have to sometimes be prepared to give your life for it because the king said so. Three cardinal sins, murder, idol worshipping, and immorality, certain immoral acts. No exceptions for that. No exceptions. And that's a test. And some people don't understand it. Some people did. And throughout our history, we have heroes, men and women, who were willing to give their lives for what they believed in. Some were too weak. Yes? How about adultery? How about yeah. Adultery is one of the three cardinal sins. You said murder. Immor murder, idol worshiping, and immor I called it immorality. Okay. Because immorality is a larger, broader category than just adultery, which is understood in this culture as being only with a married woman. Whereas immorality is a broader topic that involves even mar women who are not married, who it's forbidden for us to be with. Okay? So that's, of course, the Shavuat Elohim. That's the oath that we have between us and Hashem. We cannot break that. We cannot go against that no matter what. Of course, depending on the circumstance, depending on which mitzvah it is. Okay, the last pasuk uh, here is as follows. Another difficult pasuk, but this is more or less what it means. Don't try to run away. Don't remain in bad, in sin. Because whatever Hashem wants to do, He can do. Wow. What's going on here? So the simple meaning is, don't try to escape Hashem. Don't think that if you run away to another country, He won't catch you there. He's everywhere. Whatever He wants, He can do. Right? Let me see here. One second. Yeah. Yonah, try to run away. Remember the story with Yonah? We're going to review it in Yom Kippur. Hashem catches up to him, with him in the, in, the, in the waters, in the stormy seas. Hashem is everywhere. So, by saying, well, I'm going to go away, I'm going to do this, it's not going to happen with me, it's not going to happen to me, it won't affect me. Why? Because, Hashem can do anything He wants. Who's going to go against him? The Alta Mod Bedavara, however, he's adding something else. He's saying, don't be overconfident that just because nothing has happened yet, you might as well just stay doing what you're doing wrong. No, Alta Mod Bedavara. Repent, change it, let go of it because it may catch up with you later on. Just because it hasn't by now doesn't mean anything because Hashem can get to you at any point, at any time. So don't continue. Because whatever Hashem wants, He can do. 
He can postpone it for 25 years. And, oh, nothing has happened. <laughs> he's just postponing it. He wants you to marry off your children, then he's going to get back at you. <laughs> he wants because the kids don't deserve to suffer. So therefore, don't think like that, that you can just escape it and run away from it. Yonatan ben Uziel has another interpretation here that he's talking about prayer. Even if things are bad, even if things haven't changed, even if things are so not right for so long, you don't have to allow yourself to stay that way for the rest of your life. Al ta'amot bedavara, meaning Who says it has to stay this way? Turn to him, pray to him, beg him, do whatever you can, and don't just give up. And this, according to this interpretation, means it does, things don't have to stay, things don't have to remain bad if they are bad. Turn in prayer, go and beg him, continue to ask, and maybe at some point it will change. There have been couples that I've, that I've heard after 17 or 20 years, they were childless, right? All of a sudden, the woman gave birth. So many years? What happened? And it's not because of new technology. So somehow Hashem listened to their prayers and after a while, or they committed themselves to a mitzvah and through their many, many actions, Hashem says, okay, the time is, is ripe now. Don't ever give up. Don't allow the situation to just remain the way it is now if it's not too good. Pray at least. Turn to Him. After all, Hashem controls everything. Hashem can change decrees. Hashem can change one's mazal, if need be. Okay. He continues on to say, and this is a continuation of this pasuk, In other words, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in control of everything, of the entire world. There's nobody that can oppose him, nobody that can tell him what to do. Obviously, the, the, the simple meaning of this is that you cannot outsmart him. You cannot outsmart the system. Once Hashem has decided that things should be a certain way, that's the way it's going to be. But why does he tell us this? For a very important reason. Sometimes a gezerah comes out, a decree comes out in Shammai, and it's true, we cannot change it. There are times, however, when the gezerah is pending or has not come yet, that you go to a tzaddik, Tzaddik gives you a blessing, and he's, he has such a tremendous cough, the Tzaddik, this righteous man, Tzaddik gozer v'kadosh baruchu mekayem. The Tzaddik will decree, and he, through his prayers and supplications, that Hashem will listen and fulfill the wishes of the Tzaddik. But sometimes it's too late, or sometimes Hashem does not allow the Tzaddik to even see what is happening. As during the Holocaust and during the destruction of the Temple, you think Tzaddikim were aware of what was about to happen? Had they all known, they would have told their constituents, get out of here, flee. Some of them did. Because they smelled something was wrong. They sensed, obviously, Meshamayim, it was meant to be like that. But what about all the others? They didn't know that it was going to happen? They just went like sheep to the slaughter? They didn't know. Many of them did not know. Why? Tzaddikim did not know? They're told through dreams. They're told through all kinds of simony. When Hashem... Gezerah comes out, it's concealed from even from the tzaddikim. Even tzaddikim don't know. And even the tzaddikim, unfortunately, were trapped and fell and died. That's what happened during the destruction of the first, second temple. And now, in the Holocaust, how could it happen? We're not asking not only how could it happen to them, but how come they didn't know even? At least had they known, they, they, know they would have told people, they could have saved some people. No. Obviously, when the, the, the Gezerah already comes out, it's delivered. Sometimes it's too late. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. And people, of course, who need to experience this Holocaust will not even be aware of it. They won't even figure out what's going on. That's unfortunately when things are at that stage, when it's a terrible decree of Shammayim. Another important idea about these Pesukim in general, why he stresses the, the supremacy of Hashem and Hashem's Ashgacha in the world is for the following reason. There's an emphasis throughout Sefer Kohelet, a very important emphasis on Ashgacha. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in charge. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu oversees everything in the world. He didn't just create the world and bail out and is no longer around like some claimed. He's around, he's aware of everything. 
Everything is recorded. He sees everything. He knows of everything. That's part of our emunah. We're very, very strong in this belief that there is complete hashgacha in Yunah in the world, and there is even hashgacha pratit, custom, single, personalized hashgacha for every individual Jew. Hashem knows exactly what his needs are and provides for him exactly what he needs at the time he needs, as long as, of course, we're deservant of that. But the hashgacha is always there. On the other hand, even though there's hashgacha, there is also free will. There is a certain area in our life where we make the determination, we make the decisions, not he does. We determine and we decide whether we act in certain ways, whether we perform mitzvah, whether we're helpful or not helpful. There are certain areas, and that area is called Yirat Shamayin, the fear of heaven, where we are the ones that will exercise free will. So this is an important point that he stresses various times in order to take away from those people whose mindset is either there's no ashgaha at all, I can get away with it, I can do whatever I want, and he says, no way, you can't. He's the one that determines everything. And to take away from the other opposite philosophy, there is only ashgaha, and even what I do is decreed from above. In other words, even the bad things. See what I mean? Two complete opposite philosophies. Either there's no ashgaha, has shalom, or everything is bashgacha, everything is predetermined, everything is predestined. There's complete predestination on every detail of our life. We're robots. No, we're not. We're not robots. We're not animals that just function or operate by instinct. We have free will. And we've already spoken about the fine line between what is predestined, what is bashgacha, and what is up to us to decide in life. What is completely up to us. And that's a very important fine line because there are certain things that we determine that we determine their outcome. Otherwise, how are we going to be judged? If everything is determined from above, what did we do? What did we contribute? Obviously, man's contribution is very significant, very important, and it's limited to a certain area of mitzvot in Avirot, obviously, good deeds, bad deeds. That's what we call free will. And that's the meaning here of what he says over here. Al tibahel mi panav telech, al ta'amod v'davar was, don't escape or think of escaping by assuming that there's no ashgacha. There is ashgacha. On the other hand, don't think like the other ones who say, Hashem does everything anyway. Right? It's up to Him. No. When it comes to mitzvot, it's up to you. There is ashgacha. There is very, very big ashgacha in many facets of our life, in all kinds of details. There's ashgacha in but when it comes to, to the area of mitzvot and averot, of ben adam lechaverot, how we conduct ourselves with our fellow Jew, with our friends, with our spouse, with Hashem, what we do, how we wake up, whether we go to pray, where we go to learn, whether we do a mitzvah, put on tefillin, put on a mezuzah, put on tzitzit, any mitzvah, that's completely up to us. Even though people have certain inclinations, yes, people have certain backgrounds and education, which makes it easier for them because they just are born and bred and raised in this, right? And others didn't have it. They grew up in Boucher. You know where that is? Imagine growing up in Boucher. I don't think there's a Jewish community there. You know where that is, Boucher? You heard of that? You didn't hear of Boucher? Boucher. Yeah? Near Amadan? And further south. Boucher. Yeah? Or imagine growing up in Arak. You heard of that city? Yeah? Or imagine growing up in Mazandaran. Did you hear of that one? Mm-hmm. <laughs> no Jewish community, no strong community, right? So what? Hashem gave us the chokhmah, gave us the neshama, gave us the ability to discover, to find out. Has to show a person does not do it, then he has to come back. That's the topic of reincarnation. Grew up in Siberia, grew up in a place where there's not even a Chabad. Try to find a place like that, right? Of course, okay, it's not his fault. So Hashem says, well, I have to send you back. Next time, I'm going to send you to Me'a Sharim, to Bnei Barak. You won't have an excuse. We have the ability, we have the potential. Unfortunately, because of the weaknesses of human nature, of course, we're just distracted and misled. And, you know, before we know it, life goes by and time is lost and it's very difficult to fix everything. 
Still, even though it's late, it's not too late. You can still fix. And right now, before, before Yom Kippur, we have to remember that, that it's always possible to fix. It's always possible to start a new year from scratch, a clean chapter in a life. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu will help us achieve that. Amen.